Hello and welcome to all of you. I'm Joe, here with me is my co host, Dan. Hello and greetings. And we're reviewing, as the title says, Black Robe, a controversial, if really great movie, all about first contact. It's being put in the medieval cinema podcast because essentially this falls into almost the medieval period, given that it was in the 16th century to almost 17th century, thereabouts, that this movie takes place in, during the time when Champlain was in command of the fort and of, well, the fort that we see at the beginning of the movie, and of Nouvelle France. A very important period, and as what be was Nouvelle France became Canada, to a large extent. So, yeah. This movie juxtaposes the French point of view versus the native one. And we get to see that both sides are fairly ignorant of each other, but that there's also a desire for what each other have. The natives in the movie have an initial misconception about Jesus, believing that actually it's Captain Clock, which is just, <laughs> yeah. The movie involves a priest or a Jesuit called La Fogue, who is wishing to venture out to go and become the, um, I guess you could say, uh, local uh, clergyman of a, di of a distant village up the river. Champlain asks the native, well, the Huron tribe, to take care of La Fogue, in that he is a very important part of the French community. Naturally, he pays the natives and says, we'll give you all these, and we will then, you know, be very much in your debt if you can guide him. La Fogue takes a young man by the name of Daniel, a youth who is of a rather fickle and untrustworthy nature, who makes Han Solo or even Jabba the Hutt look like, well, Luke Skywalker. And I'm actually being pretty generous about this kid. This kid's a punk. He's a son of a gun. He's, he's led by his lines. Yeah. that We're being polite and kind here in our assessment of the character. He's a very disreputable sort. Honestly, I would not trust him with even $5. Because I just know he'd take it, sell me out, and then shoot me in the head and take what else I have. He is that sort of scum. And the natives, though, end up... These aren't the natives of that Hollywood tries to feed us. They are kind of human. Some of them are disreputable. Some of them are really great people. Um... You have, in turn, the French, who are not the French that were fed by English education system of Canada. That is to say, they're not total scum and deserve to all perish. No, no, no. They're complex figures. The French have no desire to take the land from the natives. Some of them want to go back to France because they don't like Nouvelle France, but th they've been assigned there by the crown. On the other hand, some of the peasants don't want to go back because, well, it means going back to a caste system. They like the freedom of Nouvelle France, and they just want to be left alone. But they're scared of some of the natives. And as you see in this film, it's kind of with good reason to an extent. As, well, when, what we later see of the Iroquois, it's, yeah. You don't screw around with those guys. They are scary and kind of wicked. Um, there is... Now, the Hurons end up may, agreeing to take the uh, Pal La Fogue, but then almost immediately start pressing him for what he owns, for his tobacco and whatnot. And La Fogue tells him, no, I need this to trade with your cousins across the river. I'm sorry, but you've already been paid. I can't, I don't have any means to pay you. But the Eurons ha, have no 
they're fickle. Like, they're, they just see it as, well, you're holding out on us. But he's actually not. He doesn't actually have any means of paying them. Technically, the tobacco he has isn't even his. He's a middleman. So if he actually gives it to them and he were to return, he'd probably be stripped of his uh, status so, as a Jesuit. So he's just going, no, no, and I don't actually have the means. Um, they don't like him reminding them that they've been paid. They come to believe that he's some sort of demon or raven in human flesh, which is pretty funny, but the consequences of that are not funny. So they trick him because they basically make him think that it's a stopover uh, with another tribe, which it kind of is. But in reality, they're going to a shaman to try to seek him out so that he could help them get rid of La Vogue. The shaman tries to do some weird incantation to uh, hollow him, but it all it is is annoying him, which is... A kind of funny scene. Um, but La Folg ends up walking away, only to get lost in the forest and become increasingly frightened. And then he accidentally runs into the Eurons, who had no intention of finding him, pleased that he was lost in the forest. But they find him nonetheless by accident. Uh, he throws himself against them in gratitude and tells them how much he adores them. And proceeds to stop being icy towards them, because previously he was a little icy. But... The thing is, they are, after seeing him on thought and decide to start sharing everything he knows from, you know, the Bible to how to produce music, they decide that he really must perish, which is just kind of horrifying because he's being nice to them now. Earlier, they were frightened by his knowledge of writing an ability to convey knowledge to others through writing, which there is some historical truth to that. They also didn't fully trust his teachings because they don't know the Bible. Daniel believes them to be true Christians because he's an idiot um, and doesn't understand them. And I say he's an idiot because he's an idiot uh, because his uh, small Daniel is telling him that you know yeah. it is right to fall in love with them now i'm not saying that the native culture is not to be respected in the film there is some beauty to it and there is some truth to some of their ideas but daniel the way his arguments are presented against the folks yeah he's he doesn't realize it but he's arguing against keeping them like against not assimilating them without realizing because all of his arguments, I think, are in favor of, like, why they need to be assimilated and converted. But on the other hand, you, the movie makes a better argument as you go along of the values of some of the culture, local culture of the Eurons, for example. And by that, I mean, like, the idea that life is a dream, really, and that dreams are sometimes truer than life itself, than the real world. And in that, there is an interesting belief system. And what's funny is that in the past, in the 20th century, you had the Swiss and the French and other psychological schools led by Jung and Freud and Campbell, who, and I specify the Swiss and the French because they, along with the British, they ended up delving into this research and discovering that there is a lot of truth behind dreams and whatnot. And there's an entire science. So the natives, in a way, were a little ahead of their time in wanting to psychoanalyze dreams. So we do have to give a lot of credit there. La Fogue does not understand this. That being said, he is bringing with him the classics and whatnot. So there's a lot of value there, and he is bringing reading and writing, which is a beautiful art and a necessary one for a civilization to exist and for you to have laws and have community and whatnot. So there are things that each other could learn from one another. But they are not, unlike the Disney Pocahontas movie, they are just not learning from one another to an extent. But at the same time, they are in the movie. Just certain individuals are. Um, you look at... But on the other hand, the natives unconsciously are 
appreciative of the French culture to an extent when they say that the French language sounds like birds. Like that of the birds. And that's beautiful. They don't mean it that way, but the French language, salit très belle. But uh, it is very beautiful. That said, the real inciting force, okay, after the scene where La Fog gets annoyed with the shaman screeching and hollering at him like a maniac and splashing the shaman, which is funny. He splashes him with the paddle. The guy deserves it. Um, La Fog is abandoned by the tribe without any supplies except the treasures that the natives were paid ironically and some of the tobacco and of course they took the food and whatnot and they want to go hunt moose because eh, that seems funner than you know just going a few extra miles ahead and Daniel decides that he'd rather go with the natives than stick with La Fog. Initially, the natives, some of them, start to complain that um, that the chieftain's daughter, who has been sleeping with Daniel, is possessed to desire Daniel. But in turn, later... It is noted by an elder, no, 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 Daniel's possessed. So you actually have some of the tribe who are starting to notice. And some of them are in favor of getting rid of Daniel because they find him, well, he's a stalker. Like, let's be honest. His girlfriend dumped him and he's stalking her. He's not a good ex. And so one of them decides, okay, I'm just going to shoot him. Like, then I'll solve, solve this stalking issue. But then the chieftain says, no, that's murder. I don't want that. But there's also a philosophical statement that comes, bef I think, after that scene, where the chieftain comments that the problem that the Hurons face is that they've become dependent on the goods the French deliver to them. And that this spells the ending of the tribes. And that this will be their undoing. They are getting more and more dependent on what the Europeans have to offer, just as the Europeans are completely dependent on what the natives have to offer. And But the difference is that the French are learning how to survive and thrive in the land. The natives are unlearning how to do that to an extent and are becoming more and more dependent on what the Europeans are giving them and bringing them. And so you have this collision between the cultures, which is kind of seeing the Hurons being devoured by the French in a way and becoming French. And you have, in turn, the Iroquois who end up capturing, well, they capture some of the natives when some of them decide to, under the leadership of the chieftain, go back for La Fogue, who has taken refuge in one of the abandoned settlements because... He's desperate, he's alone, and he's hungry. And you can see he's very lonely, and he's wounded. That said, when he sees the chieftain's wife get wounded, he throws himself into the middle of the battlefield, uncaring for his own safety, probably believing he's going to perish no matter what, and decides to absolve her of her sins, even though she was advocating for his death, and she advocated for his abandonment. He doesn't care. And this is actually a, a part of the noble nature of the Jesuits. And he is, of course, knocked out. The Iroquois decide to torture him. Now, La Fogue came from a background where he was of probably middle class. He ended up getting tutored by someone who was tortured and had to have his head almost cleaved off and um, black, not blackened, but burnt by the natives, specifically probably the Iroquois, and he lost a lot of fingers. And it, this is horrifying. Um, now that said, it's implied, I think, that La Fogue fell in love with a noble woman. She passed away, and he never recovered. So he decided to go become a Jesuit and move to Nouvelle-France, despite his mother being stricken with 
by the idea of him moving away. So La Fogue is a man of deep loyalties and a great deal of love for others. And so when him and a few of the others are brought to the Iroquois settlement, he decides that, well, I like the exchange between him and Daniel where Daniel says, forgive me, father, because Daniel gets frightened of the death that's sure to take place because the Iroquois want them to run a gauntlet as they bludgeon these men and women to death. And La Folga has the best rejoinder. Why? He asks coldly. And Daniel stutters for an excuse and because he's frightened of death and he's he doesn't have the courage to... Because earlier he advocated for the native paradise or afterlife, which is where you'll just have to endlessly hunt the native spirits. Not the native spirits, but the animal spirits. And the trouble is... This is probably not a paradise for the animal spirits, I'm just going to be honest. And the trouble is he does not have the courage to hold or the will to hold to that belief system. So he falls back on his Christianity and that fog is cold and tells him that uh, God will forgive all sins, but refuses to forgive the man himself, which you can understand why that fog is at this point like, screw you, you got me into this mess. Now, Fog is made to run the gauntlet, is bludgeoned and nearly killed. Daniel, credit to him, comes to his rescue, at long last doing something right. This after a lifetime of errors and stupidity, but eh, let's hold that. Let's completely hold that against him, because this is his fault. This is entirely his fault. If he had actually, I don't know, told Chieftain's daughter, you know, we're like, can you hold your tribesmen to their word? And she, if she had had, you know, a backbone and held her parents to their word like ugh, honestly this tribe was so fickle anyways the Iroquois um, beat them bloody and mortally wound the chieftain who also has an arrow stuck in him that said the Iroquois decide that they will trade the Jesuit over to the Dutch to, who will ransom the Jésuit La, La Fogue over to the French. And what they'll get out of this is, well, you know, supplies and muskets. And they also want to try asking the Dutch and the English for the knowledge of how to reload guns, because that's the knowledge they don't have. So they require thinking in terms of war and battle. And in turn, they're being extremely brutal and horrible to their prisoners. They're torturing them in a horrific manner that I... Wow. Like, wow. Anyways, uh, the chieftain's daughter uh, seduces one of the men into letting them go. Um, okay. She did kind of have to do it. I'm not going to judge her too harshly here because... When you need to survive. Yeah. I blame Daniel. Yeah. If he was more of a man, his girl, his woman never would have had to do this. This is his fault. Had he... And I honestly hope that if she is, ends up with child, it ends up being the Iroquois child. That'd be a step up from Daniel in this film. I'm harsh and hate him because I honestly hate him. Yeah, I don't see that uh, couple staying together. I don't either. But like I said, I have no wish for him to father children of her. He doesn't deserve children. Sorry if I'm harsh with him. I am I honestly despise the Daniel character in this film. And I actually feel bad for you to share a name with him. Um, but, and I feel bad for Danny LaRusso sharing a name with him. <laughs> but, yeah, I feel bad for everyone who, uh, fictional and otherwise, who've had to bear a Daniel name, the name Daniel, and share it with this um, fellow. That said, the chieftain who has had constant nightmares of his doom is taken to the island where he is doomed to perish. Now, Folk tries to convert him at the last minute. Um, What's-her-face, the daughter of the chieftain, 
it gets horrified and tries to argue against this. And so her, her father does not die having converted. But on the other hand, he did end up becoming curious towards the end about the Christian faith. And so he kicks the bucket and disgustingly, his daughter decides to abandon his corpse there. And I say disgustingly because it is disgusting. Uh, the body is to be devoured by the ravens and whatnot. So uh, she obviously has no sense of filial duty because even the natives had some burial customs or at least some funerary customs. We do know that for a fact. She just refuses to dole them out to her dad, which, because it risks having the, now here's the difference between father and daughter. Uh, the chieftain's uh, wife ended up giving birth to a child that did not live for long. It died in childbirth, or at least stillborn. And that fog ended up uh, baptizing the child and absolving it and saying, receive it into heaven, O Lord. And the chieftain said, no, this is an act of kindness, not cruelty, is what he told the shaman and the other uh, tribesmen. So what would probably happen is that La Fogue, when they would give out even the Euron custom, would insist on at least baptizing and having the chieftain received into heaven, at least posthumously. There's no harm in it, in the act. But daughter begrudges everything. And at the end, she refuses to accompany the Jesuit forward, wanting to disown him and w walk away from him. And you could tell in her eyes she blames him, even though it's kind of her fault, along with Daniel's fault. But the thing is, because of her dad's dream, the that the, La Fog ends up wandering off on his own, she decides, you know, let's ditch him. She's not trustworthy. In my opinion, she will obviously abandon Daniel for someone stronger. Yeah, and it's at this point where Daniel hesitates. Hesitates, and it puts doubt in his relationship with her. Yeah, which means it's doomed. Exactly. But let's hope she abandons him. I honestly have no compassion for him. I have no compassion for her. And I know that's harsh, but neither of them are deserving of compassion. She's unfilial and wants to and would leave her father's body to the crows. I can't even fathom that. I'm sorry, but like... Not even... Like, I, we're French. To us, it's like, yeah, okay, we're part native, but our native side is going, what of the ancestors? What of your ancestors? Our French side is saying, quoi de vos ancêtres? C'est ton père. Honneur ton père et ta mère. Honor your father and mother. I can't even fathom that. And Daniel just going, okay, we can abandon the corpse. Are you kidding me? That's basically your dad-in-law. How could you do that? It, and like the the entire both of them are horrifying and are horrible human beings. And I could, I honestly have more compassion for uh, that fault because here it he is. He clings to his values. Yeah, and you have to chief. No, no, run, run. At least there. And you get the sense that the Chieftain and La Folle came to love each other. And they genuinely became best friends. Even though they didn't really exchange words over it towards the end of the film. They just came to love each other in their own way. It it was honestly the best part of this film. I, I wish we got another film with a French Jesuit and natives and a native Chieftain bonding. Played by these two actors. Maybe different characters, but... It would have been nice to see a bromance movie like that. I'd love to see a movie like Black Robe, except focus more on the positives of a friendship between the across the two cultures. And not a romance, I mean a genuine friendship and whatnot. That'd be a beautiful story. Eh, given that we're writing movie scripts, maybe we should write one. <laughs> There's an idea. Anyways, actually, seriously, let's write that down. Um, La Folge arrives in a new, in the village he was supposed to get to in the dead of winter probably would have gotten there sooner had there not been delays yeah i'm sharp toned but yeah but this movie is honestly great 
even though there isn't a lot. La Fogue is... Now, the, this village tribe, I actually get... No, like, they're very reasonable. Um, well, these... They slew the previous priest. I'd slay the previous priest, given his comportment with them. He lied to them all, like, throughout his entire time there. Well, not the one who's still alive. Like, there were two priests. The other one, apparently, the old, the one currently still alive, he was the lesser priest, and he was just doing what he was told. But um, he's unsure of how to approach the natives because his boss got um, butchered. But his boss was being a total monster. Saying that uh, the, the water for baptism will cure them of the... Smallpox. Yeah. Which we have to bear in mind. While there was a large number of natives that were to pass away to smallpox, the better part of natives in North America interbred with the European settlers because there was not enough European settlers on their own to fully... Um, populate the whole of north america so what historically happened is that the two groups basically amalgamated and thus you got canada and the united states that are founded off of well native and european settlers english-speaking canada and the united states are formed from the mixture of english and native culture and and I guess with Southern U.S. also uh, Toltec and uh, Mex Aztec cultures and peoples and Mayans mixing together, which is pretty fascinating. As for the French, it's more the Hurons and the Cree uh, in northern Quebec that amalgamated with the French, and so you got les Français. I guess Louisiana also intermingled. And then, of course, you throw in the Africans when they arrived into when they were brought across the Atlantic, uh, they ended up intermingling as well. So uh, the genetic history of North America is fascinating in some ways. Um, you got all sorts of folks from Africa and Europe. Um, but that said, this movie kind of deals with that. Now you have a, a terrible smallpox epidemic that's been ravaging the village. And the thing is, the survivors are actually surviving pretty well but they have not attacked the remaining white uh settlers they've or at least the only white settler left um i got the sense that the other white settler probably passed away to smallpox for the most part this tribe did not seem like they were they had murdered more than the local priest who was lying to them and even they state they may hint that he was not okay with them he was not nice to them he was lying through his teeth and treating them like garbage. And so they only have one condition when they at last... Um, they have actually two conditions when they come to La Fogue. Now, the way they treat La Fogue is nothing like um, how the previous tribe treated La Fogue or like how the previous priest treated this native tribe. Now, La Fogue, you could well understand why he'd be a little angry with the natives and might have developed a bit of bigotry towards them because look at how he's been treated. He's been abandoned. He's been left to starve. He's been tortured. He's had his index finger chopped off and would have had more chopped off and might have been... He was not gelded, but he might nearly have been. So, and he observed others being gelded. He has good reason to be a little angry, but he ends up a little... Actually, when he ends up hearing the story, oh yeah, the previous guy was lying to them and screwing them over. He kind of reacts like, wait, but shouldn't we have told them the truth? Why do you lie? Well, you know, like the old guy makes some excuses, but says, you can see that he is in a, the, ba the worst story, but he's like, well, you know, the, this was why we did it. I don't think that was wise. No, he's like, I, I don't agree with that. He makes it clear he doesn't agree with it. You know, the old man, Okay, well, you're the new guy in charge. Okay, you do it your way. But I don't, I think you should maintain the lie if you want to baptize them. Because our job is to baptize them. Now, folk does not agree with this philosophy. So, what ends up happening is that we end. Now, there's a beautiful scene where he, that old man, he says, Father, you are dying. And it is evident that he's dying to smallpox. And he's like, Do you have confession? I have a confession to make. Do you have one? 
And you have the old man who says, yes, I would hear yours if you would hear mine. And so they, they confess to each other and he gives the final funerary rites to this old man. Now, unlike Daniel and the one native girl, he actually buries this old man. He shows him the proper respect. Seeing him show that, do this act of filial piety in a way, the natives realize this guy is not like the previous one. So they come to him and they ask, Father, uh, we would ask of you, you know, like, how is it they worded it? Um, you know, like, can you give us the baptism to cure us and save us of the smallpox? Now, Falk tells them, the baptism, the holy water will not save you from, from the smallpox. All it will do, according to my religion, is save your soul. But it will not save you physically. You might still die to smallpox. Oh. But, and if we still insist on being baptized, it will not save you. Yes, but, Father, we must ask of you, do you love us? And that folk thinks back on all the natives he's met, all the torments he got inflicted on him, and even thinks of the shaman who hated him and says, while crying, we, his enfant, yes, my children, I love you. And moved the natives, or at least almost all of them, go into the church and agree to be baptized. Which, this is honestly the most beautiful scene in the movie. Yeah. This was a spiritual scene. Like, the mass baptism, there's a very big beauty to it. It reminds me of the, of a scene I saw of one movie of, of when Clavis got for, first got baptized alongside 30,000 other Thank. It's, it, it invokes that scene. And, well, it's French cinema, and that was French cinema, so it, it makes sense. But, like, La Fogue here, in a way, this feels like a scene where it is preserving the... It is like the natives are kind of... It's like, okay, if I were to explain it, them and La Fogue are becoming one people. And it's not exactly in the context of uh, La France's French people, but it's not in the context of purely being Hurons. They're kind of, they're becoming, I guess you could say, Métis. They're becoming, they're moving into the middle between the two civilizations or cultures. And I actually like that. Yeah, I'm Métis. I've got a vested interest in that. I will freely admit I'm an historian and I love French culture and because I'm primarily French. So as, I have a vested interest in that. But, as am I. Mm -hmm. But let us be honest, we also love, we do love deep down our, our native side as well because we're part native. Just as we have some Scottish and Irish blood in us that moves us to love those cultures and civilizations. As for the English blood in us, we're ashamed of it. Screw it. I'm kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry, the French side of us is so much stronger, as is the Scottish and Irish side, so we always have to make fun of the English. But, la réalité, c'est que this is a beautiful movie about collision and about how forgiveness can happen. And that it is only through acceptance of one's own errors and mistakes, as well as being fully honest with each other. And that there is a way for people to come together. There is a way for the natives and the Europeans to come together. There is a way. And let's be honest, the French centuries ago were leading that way. The French never came with war in their hearts against the natives. They came with the goal of escaping France, which was at that time tearing itself apart under the incompetent rule of Le Valois Capet and Bourbon Capet, two dynasties which were disastrous for France. And they were only interested in absolute power. The citizens didn't, who settled in Nouvelle France came with the objective of finding a new home. And if you look up the records of Les Coureurs de Bois, they truly tried to mix the two civilizations together and try to bring people together. And this is what happened. You had 
Quebec uh, and La Culture Franco Canadien is a, a blend. And let's be honest, even the North American French variant of Catholicism, because every Catholicism is kind of different, this branch of it is very much a mixture of the native faith and the Catholic faith. And it takes a lot of ideas from both. And there's, like, if, if you want to look up French Canadian culture, seriously do. It is truly a blend. And it is heir to two traditions, that of the European, but also that of the native. And it has retained all that is beautiful about European culture and French culture. And it and there is beauty there. And it has also retained the beauty and the freedom that the natives clearly had. So on that note, let's rate this movie. I'm going to say a four. I will say a four. I love that uh, they rip away the common misconceptions of uh, both. Of both. The first settlements and, pardon the word, colonization and the noble savage. It rips the image of both away because... It, and allows us to see what was true. What yeah. Tr what truly happened. And it also shows, like, you look at the beauty of the cathedral of La Cathédrale in France, and you're going, oh, it's so beautiful. Why is the floor so filthy? You know, like, you can't help but go, hey, the floor's been left to rot, and it, it looks utterly filthy. So that you get a sense of, oh, there is neglect on the French end towards their own culture at the time. Because this was just before the era of the French wars of religion. France did not end up... Uh, clinging stronger to its faith until Louis uh, tries probably up and they were in a bit of a decay period to an extent and that's because of the last Valois Capet who were just well Francois and Henri uh, Durr were really good monarchs but then after them like oh my gosh you had nothing but bad monarchs and uh, until Henri Cat. Then you had Louis Kreis, who was really good. But anyways, but the point is, this is a beautiful film about how much the human spirit can endure, about faith, not just in, in a higher power, but in each other, and about crossing linguistic and cultural barriers, and about the beauty of two cultures that struggled against each other, though they shouldn't have, but who came together in the end and came to love one another up until they were both sadly defeated with the Huron, les Huron being annihilated to a large extent 15 years after the events of this film by the Iroquois but a great chunk of the Huron fled to the French who of course took them in and the two began to blend their cultures together French language prevailed, but their faiths kind of mixed together, as did their culture. And so you've got to bear in mind, most of the population of Nouvelle-France basically were former Hurons. Or basically Hurons, because how can you be former when Hurons was an ethnical tribal identity? So essentially, Nouvelle-France became Huronie. Uh, that is to say, the Huron uh, people, the Huron people, and the French and the Nouvelle French melded together. They they fused into one because they had to. Otherwise, the Iroquois and the English would have wiped them out, and the English were keen to wipe them out. As were the Dutch. The reason why I think it's a tragedy that Quebec lost in the Seven Year War is because, honestly, I think Nouvelle France was. I don't know. I guess I just think I, I like Quebec. I love Quebec. I love the history. And I think they were doing a better job pushing forward. Like the two, like to cross the distance between each other. And I think there, there was a great tragedy when Quebec lost on the Abraham Plains. That said, I do love the British. Don't get me wrong. I love them. 
And I think they did bring about a lot of good. They brought a lot of bad too. But there's a lot that I think that would have done, been done better with the French in charge. On the other hand, I'm going to actually praise one thing. The Americans brought the positive of the American Revolution for themselves. That was good for the American people. But I think that Canada would have been better off under the auspices of France to an extent. And I know that's a weird attitude and that's very biased, but I am biased. I'm just being honest. On the other hand, it's fine to disagree with me because, you know what, that's the beauty of history. It's just the greatest adventure story ever written and it'll continue to be and there's different perspectives on it and that's the beauty of history. And But seriously, watch this movie. It's one of the greatest from the 90s. It's probably the greatest historic movie of the 90s, in my opinion. And there was quite a few from that era that were good. Yeah, this is just the best one. But tell us what you think, and don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button. And don't forget to stay awesome while you're at it.